when our boys got into middle school, they started playing Yaffle football and then they went into high school football and my parents could hardly stand not to be here. They would come out in the fall and stay with us, you know, six or seven weeks. The bonus to that was that my mom cooked like four times a week and she would cook all day. You know, I'd be at the church working and they would be at school, but she'd start cooking and she made it so special. We'd walk in and the smell of what was cooking and everything out on the table ready for us. My mom was intentional in everything she did, from gift giving to her cooking to the way she parented. And then I saw that. I started seeing it as my kids got older, and it was who I was becoming too. She was the most amazing cook. Those times with my mom sparked my desire to cook because, you know, there's something so comforting about a meal. Food is comforting and it, it brings people together. There's something so community oriented about a meal. We transitioned lead pastor of this church a few years ago, and I was looking for something to do. Galen kept saying, you have recipes all over this house. They're on index cards, and they're on scrap paper, and on the top of a cardboard box, and they're everywhere. Why don't you put together a cookbook? I need to, someone to tell me, really tell me, because your husband, you know, they just say stuff to make you happy. So I needed somebody that didn't really, would just tell me the truth. So I called Mandy first, and I said, Mandy, Galen's been thinking I should do a cookbook. She said, oh my gosh, you've got to do it. Do it. You have to do it. I have this great idea. Why isn't this your focus for your part of Flourish Conference? And could we get it in time for the conference? And that started the whole thing. The table in our family is just a constant. It, it needs to be in all of our lives. It, it's not just for people that are married or people that have kids, but it's where you have community. We go to lunch, we sit at a table. We go out to breakfast, we sit at a table. Even if you just have coffee, more than likely you're at a table or at a coffee table and you're sitting in chairs, but you gather. My mom would always let the boys bring a friend over too if they wanted to have friends for dinner. And that just kind of started being something that we did as a family too. That might be the only time of the day you see your child, your teenager, eye to eye. And the Bible tells us that the eyes are the window to the soul. So if I can see my own grown son's eyes or their wives or look into my grandkids' eyes and now the little ones and, and see, I can tell. Are they going through anything? Is life treating them good? And I know how to pray. And if we're setting the pattern at the table and talking about you know, God's promises and His faithfulness and how He's proven Himself over and over in our lives, then that table is going to be a associated with that too. When I decided to do this cookbook, I thought it can't be just a regular cookbook because I've looked at many of them. And I do find recipes online, but that's my least favorite way. I want to touch and hold a book. So I thought, what do I want? I wanted to tell stories from my life. There are certain recipes in that book that mean everything to me. My hope and my prayer for this cookbook is that not only will it be a place to, to grab a recipe or something quick or something that's tasty, but more than that, it'll remind you, hey, we gotta gather at the table. That's what she said. It's all about the table. It's truly a gathering place for friends and family and our loved ones. And so many wonderful things happen at the table. That's what I want us to remember. It's a place of acceptance, of love, of community. The table, it really is where life happens. You guys, I am so excited to be here tonight. And the cool thing is you can sit down. I mean, the cool thing for me, I don't know about you, but last night was night one, and I go home tomorrow so I can say whatever I want tonight. And I think that's the best part. They don't, I don't, they don't take me to breakfast tomorrow, and I'm just going to say it. I really feel something special, and I know um, Christy did too during worship. But I wanted to um, tell you some, a little secret. You probably know this. Maybe you don't. So um, your pastors, we really do love them. Our family loves them so much. But I, um, I became aware of Christy Starling in 2002, and so I was a lot younger than myself, and I turned on the TV on NBC, and there was this beautiful blonde, and she was in a contest, contest called Today's Superstar. It was a vocal a singing contest, and I mean, I loved it. She shared, they said, you know, she uh, had sang, and she was sang Christian songs, and she was a Christian, and she was so bold about her testimony, and I thought it was the coolest thing, and she was really awesome, and I, we, I may have voted on her every week. I called friends and families. You know, we didn't have, I don't even know if we had, did I have internet then? I guess we had internet, but we surely didn't have smartphones, and I couldn't text people, and I couldn't, you know, do it on Instagram, but we really tried so hard to get you to win. Honestly, you were the best one, and that fellow that won, if he's anywhere in the world, he probably is not doing anything like what she's doing now, 
because she should have won and she was number two, but it was not my fault because I voted every time that I could. She should have won because I tried so hard. But honestly, so just a few years ago, and I can't remember, uh, my son Dustin, who's the pastor at our church now, and his wife Mandy, she spoke here just a few months ago at um, I think maybe your last Neon event. But um, I don't know when they met you guys. I'm going to say four or five years. It's just, that sounds good. Um, with COVID, it's hard to remember those years. But Dustin came to me and said, oh, mom, I met this guy at, um, at a youth camp maybe in Oklahoma, and his name's Adam Starling. You'll never get Starling. You'll never guess who his wife is. And I said, who? And he said, Christy Starling. And I went, oh, Christy Starling from Today's Superstar? And he said, yes. And it was her. I mean, literally, I, I was like, like we're going to maybe see her sometime or talk to her. And lo and behold, Mandy had her come last year to Flourish Conference, and she sang. And I don't even know what I said at the dinner table that night because I was fangirling all over the place. You, I mean, Taylor Swift, eh, Chrissy Starling all the way. And I mean it. And um, all that to say, Christy and Adam, thank you. I can't believe I'm here, that I'm at the church, you guys, pastor, I feel so blessed. I love this church, Victory Family Church, and your staff. I've made friends. I, if I didn't have grandkids in Albuquerque, I would just come here. I would love it so much. I love, um, you guys are amazing. I had so much fun last night. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, I, as she said, my husband and I, we pastored a church in Albuquerque. It's now called Citizen Church because my son changed the name. They do that. Those, I, I mean, I'm like, why does everything have to change all the time? Can't we just have one name? We changed the name. But my family, I have three grown sons um, and three daughters-in-law and nine grandchildren ranging from four years old to 20 years old. Let me show you. Uh, oh, I got to tell you something else first. Can we stop? By? Well, I'll show the family. We'll do that first. Let's show the family. Can you, there they go. Okay, there they are. That's them. This is us. And um, they're, I think they're so beautiful. They're the most amazing people in my life. It's really what I live for. They're who I live for. And this whole message, the whole idea of the cookbook is because of those 17 people in the picture. I wanted um, to have something they could have in their hand and they could keep forever and have as a keepsake. So thank you for coming. And before I get started in the message, um, I do want to tell you, I have this cookbook. So this is not a cookbook class. And it's, I know if you are a guest here and you're thinking, you mean I came to get preached to from a cookbook? No, I'm not preaching from a cookbook. But I did write a cookbook last year, like the video said, um, just for uh, a spe something special for me is how it started. But then we decided to launch it at our conference last year. And it's really special. I hope you get it. And after tonight, I think it'll make sense to you why it's so important to me. But then the cookbook launched, and 2024 came. And I thought, what now? Because like Christy said, we, we get... Um, now, we didn't give the church to them, but we passed it along to them to be pastors in 2020. And, and 2024, um, 23, I did the cookbook, and in 24, I thought, what would I do now? And honestly, and I'm not like whining that I'm old, but I'm old. Er, I mean, 63 is not really old, but it is definitely. I get the senior discount at Waffle House and all the fast foods and movies. So, I mean, it's old. And I thought, what does somebody like me do after you write the, you know, obligatory cookbook? Um, I decided with a lot of really amazing encouragement from some Gen Z wonderful people in my life, young ladies, they said, Kay, you need to do a podcast. And I went, podcast, I thought, well, that should be easy. Um, you know, you just talk in a microphone and somebody puts it on, um, you know, social media. And I didn't realize all the layers to it, but I started a podcast in April of this year. Um, the 11th episode just dropped, because you say dropped. You don't say aired. It dropped um, last week, the 11th episode, and, and it's not cool when I try to be cool. My grandkids tell me, just be old. It's better that way. Um, but it dropped last week, and I promise you, there, um, I thought that they might be about cooking when I started, but I have 20 wonderful, fun cooking hacks on my website that are really fun. But anyway, they're not, the episodes are not about cooking. They're actually about life and everything you would talk about around your own table and topics that concern you, where you are in your life, whether you're married or single, kids or no kids. The topics are really fun, but it's not just me. I have the most amazing guests. I cannot tell you how wonderful they are. They're people I've always wanted to interview. Like, I think like I'm a newscaster. I thought this the other day watching one of the news stations, I thought, I kind of like them. That's what I do. <laughs> Not, but I get to interview wonderful people, so I hope you'll watch. So there's a card. So isn't this crazy? You know, QR codes tried to come around a few years ago, and then they failed, but they came back again. That's how I, that's how I see it. 
so you can um, go to that QR code. You can actually pull your phone out now. And this is what's cool. And I tried it, so I know it's true. You can just screenshot that. I see no one getting their camera out. I, I probably get a cry. Get your camera out. <laughs> um, and you can screenshot that. And later, you can go to it because those fun um, cooking hacks and there's access. There's, it tells you how to get to the podcast. There are links to the platforms that the podcast is on. It's everywhere you listen or watch podcasts now. So I hope you'll join me. And so many from last night did. And I've seen you um, friend me on Instagram, and I'm, I love it so much. I feel so loved. Okay, here we go. The table. I have so much to say in a little bit of time, and, and can I just tell you something funny? Last night, I sat down from speaking, and I looked at the clock, and I panicked. I thought I went really, really, really long. I thought the service started at 6.30. My watch was dead, so I never knew what time it was, and it started at 7. And then tonight, I found out, and I went, you mean I didn't preach an hour? I thought, I preached, I thought that was a really long sermon. I thought one of those people were fidgeting, but it was really 35 minutes, so it's going to go fast. But I'm glad you're here. And one more thing, you got to lighten up. You're going to have to, I, I can't do quiet, I talk a lot, and I talk fast, so you have to listen fast, and I will talk longer if you don't like laugh and say, that's so good, and you're the best speaker we've ever heard, you shout it, and then I'll just stop. Then I'll stop teaching, and I'll really, we'll wind down, we'll go have the, the dessert, which is, I think, um, popsicles, really cool ones, not like otter pops, but really good popsicles. And I'm going to sign books outside. I'm going to write something really sweet to you, not just my name. And you don't want my name. But I need you to just relax. I know it's hard on a work night, right? You come from life. You just did everything. You barely got out. You might have even been having an argument with your kids or if you're married, your spouse. And it's hard to get here on a weeknight. And to like um, she mentioned, just to breathe. But I'm just saying, God's got a word for you. So just get in, dig in, press forward, and just say, God, what do you have for me? Because because wouldn't it be a shame if we came to something like this, spent our whole night, and all we got was pasta and a salad? We need the living word that we can take out and apply tonight and tomorrow and the next day. So we're going to talk about why the table matters. You're already doing so good, I'm going to talk faster. Okay. <laughs> so I, I mean, it doesn't take much. Um, when my husband and I, his name is Galen, and um, when we got married, I was 19 and he was 23, right? We're about to have 44 years, celebrate 44 years of marriage in January. Um, <laughs> But we were in the ministry, and young and dumb and poor, and um, we bought furniture, but we never bought a table. For the first couple of years, we didn't have a dining room table. I don't know why we thought it wasn't important. We just sat at the couch and put our food on a plant stand and thought that was cool. You know, we had a vibe, and that's a good word, too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We were slay. Okay. Um, I did not say that last night. Okay. Meal time and dinner time, though, are the most important. It's the most important time of the day. Sometimes it's the only time that you see your whole family, and sometimes you don't even see them then. But it's very, very important. We, um, th this is true. Studies show that kids that sit at the table for dinner, even little toddlers that don't even know what's going on, but kids that sit at the table for dinner with their parents or parent, um, they have higher self-esteem lower uh, risk of anxiety. Their grades are better. You know, there is a reason for that. It's not because they just are smarter that they eat with you, but when your kids are sitting across from you and you're seeing them eye to eye, they have to be accountable to you. They're accountable, so grades get better. Their behavior's better. They learn how to not climb all over the table while people are eating. They learn manners. It's important. Uh, uh, there is an adolescent psychologist that said, if more families ate dinner around the table, more regularly, she would be out of a job. That's how important mealtime and dinner time is. Um, and, you know, for centuries, people ate around the table. That's all they had. You know, there was the only light in the house. They sat around the table. People came in from the fields. Everyone sat at the table. We weren't so pulled for our time, and we ate dinner together. But a funny thing started to happen in the 20th century. Um, we started getting pulled away from the table, because like in the 1920s, the first fast food chains opened. Any idea of what it was? White Castle. We don't even have one in Albuquerque. We don't have a lot of things in Albuquerque. That's where I live, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, my daughter, granddaughter, she's 10, told me that it wasn't in style anymore to tuck the front of your shirt in. She told me that before I came, because I said, I'm gonna wear this, tuck my shirt in. She said, it's not in style. I said, well, we live in Albuquerque. We're 10 years behind, doesn't matter. <laughs> but then I saw cool people up here tonight with their shirt tucked in. I'm like, you're wrong. 
10-year-old sassy pants. OK, my shirt is tucked in, but then I looked sideways, and I don't know. OK, the 20s, fast food, White Castle. In the 40s, people started getting television sets. So what do you think started drawing them away from the family dinner table? TV, and then TV dinners came around, and then TV trays. We thought that was cool, right? Do you remember? Uh, you're not as old as me, but some of you might be. When you got TV trays and you got TV dinner and you could sit around and watch whatever was on TV, the news. We weren't allowed to watch much. I grew up in a very strict home. You know, we basically watched the news. Um, but anyway, that started in the 40s. And in the 80s was a decade, 70s and 80s, that. Uh, in most households, both parents started working. For many years, it was just the dad that worked. But then moms had to start working to make ends meet, to raise family. Things got higher. You know, inflation and everything was happening, and our economy collapsed, and people had to work, both families. So both people in the family. So what do you expect happened? We got microwave ovens. So you'd make a meal, maybe, and then people would just warm it up and eat it when they wanted to. So it drew us away from the table. And now, in the when we are here in the 2024 and when smartphones came, you can imagine what pulls us away from the table now. It takes people's attention away from the table. It's electronics. Because there's always, and I'm telling you, the enemy, the devil, if you, uh, I don't know if you go to church or not, some of you may be guests, but we have an enemy and we call him the devil. Uh, you can call him Satan. But his job is to tear families apart. His job, he wants to do, is to pull families apart because the structure and the nucleus of the family is so important that his desire will be to, draw, to pull it apart. So he'll do that any way he can, whether it's your busyness, putting your kids in 14 activities so they don't have time to come home and eat dinner or go to church, or maybe it's activities anywhere. It's things we do and what we have to remember. We're, I hope when you leave here tonight, that you feel drawn back to the table. Um, you know, we don't just sit home in our family. We're very busy, but the table is super important. So there's always something important at the table. So why does the table matter to God? Okay, so that's just a wooden thing. It's just a piece of furniture, right? No, it's more than that. Why does the table matter to God? What spiritual lessons can we learn about the table? Okay, the good thing is I have four points, so that should make you happy. Four points. Number one, the table is a place of provision. So at the table, just think. Um, your physical needs are met there. You know, you're served meals there. You're hungry when you get there. You're not hungry when you get up. Um, it's a reminder of being thankful. It's a reminder of what God's provided for us. It's a place of provision. It's a place to remember and reflect. So, you know, the Bible tells us this great story um, in the book of Psalms about the children of Israel, God's chosen people. He did so many things for them. You probably remember the story. You've heard it. If you've been to church a few times, uh, maybe you've, you know, uh, seen um, you know, Prince of Egypt. You may have seen that movie. You may know that. But let me read you from Psalms, uh, a story that was written, and it's the whole title, the heading of the psalm is the need to remember and not forget. And I'm going to read quite a bit. This is the most I'll read tonight, so hang with me, and, um, and I'll talk fast. Okay, Psalm 78, the need to remember and not forget. This is a story about the children of Israel. Oh, my people, listen to my instruction. Open your ears to what I am saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons of your past, stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders, for he has issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. So the next generation might know. Even the children not yet born? Does that tell you something? They're supposed to be born. There's that. Okay, that was free. I just told you that didn't cost you a dime. Okay, and in turn, they in turn will tell their children so we're, this is for all the generations, for the unborn children, so they can do, tell their children. So each generation will set their hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. They forgot what he had done. The great wonders he had shown them, the miracles he did for their ancestors in the plain of Zoan and the land of Egypt, for he divided the sea and led them through. He made the water stand up like walls. In the daytime, he led them by a cloud, and all night by a pillar of fire, 
He split open the rocks in the wilderness to give them water, as from a gushing spring. He made streams pour from the rock, making the waters flow down like a river. Yet they kept on sinning against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They stubbornly tested God in their hearts, demanding the food they craved. They even spoke against God himself, saying, God can't give us the food in the wilderness. Oh, he can strike a rock so the water gushes out, but he can't give his people bread and meat. When the Lord heard them, he was furious. The table, the table, a place of provision. When we sit at that table, it's important that we recant the goodness of God. Because basically God in that scripture was saying, are you stinking kidding me? I did all that for you, you, you ungrateful people, you children of Israel. I parted the sea. I saved you from the Egyptians. I split the rock and gave you water. And you think I can't give you food? You know, what are you thinking? And they whined and they whined. God had done all those miracles. He provided, provided, and provided. And they're like, yeah, but you can't do this. And you know what? We do the same thing. We're like, God, you provided. And oh, yeah, you were good last week or last year. But I don't know what you've done today. I mean, today I just got up and had breath in my lungs. Oh, that's all. You know, I just had breath in my lungs. I had food to feed my children. I had some, a way to get to work. You, you know, God, sometimes we think he can't do that. But listen, he's the one that gives you a job when you're not qualified for it. Or a car that you think you could never be able to afford, that house that you need for your children. He's got it for you. And you may be thinking, but God, but God, why, 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 why? Um, but he made, he made a way out of no way for the children of Israel. Israel, and he makes a way out of no way for me and for you. He's done it so many times that I catch my own self sitting there feeling ungrateful, like jealous of what my friend has, or thinking, God, you know, why, why is this happening to me? But he said, Kay, I, I mean, you're 63. I've carried you all these years, and you're going to question now? Look at all the past you have behind you that you know that I provided, so don't question now. And I feel that way for my children and my grandchildren. And so on, um, every Monday night, we have family dinner, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment, but we started this year in January, a gratitude jar, and I've heard people talk about it, but I never did it. I thought, that's cool. Um, but this time, I went to Target and got the, a big, because I was thinking, God, we're going to be grateful for a lot of things this year. I really felt it. got a big jar, and I went on Etsy and got that cute little sticker that says gratitude jar, and, it, and I put it out on the table, and I thought, oh, they're going to mock me. I, I just knew. I didn't tell anyone, and I said, okay, family meeting, and I thought, okay, 17 of you, here we go, and I thought the 20-year-old, 19, they'd probably roll their eyes, or my husband would be like, what is she doing? But I pulled the gratitude jar out, and I said, okay, here's what we're going to do in 2024. I've written a book about this, and I preached a sermon but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna know what God has provided for us. We're going to be grateful, and we're going to speak it, and I want you to know. I want the kids to know. You know why? Because we just let some things pass like they weren't a miracle, and they were a miracle. And we don't tell our kids that was a miracle. What you did, God, that was God doing a miracle in our lives. That didn't just happen, kids. And how do you do that? That you have them write it down. So we passed the papers around. I had some really cute papers cut. They're perfect because I'm OCD. We didn't just rip it up. We passed it around with pencils. I said, here's what we're going to do. Every Monday that we meet together, all of us, each individual, we're going to write something down that we're grateful for. We're going to put our name on it and the date. And next January 1st, we're going to, when we have our great Southern um, New Year's Day meal that's in the cookbook, I'm talking with collard greens and black eyed peas and pork roast and that stuff and sweet potato casserole, all that, that we're going to pull these out, divide them up, and we're going to read to each other. We're going to remind each other of the miracles that God has done for us in 2024. And I thought they would roll their eyes. It was, I mean, I get chills thinking about it. They got so excited. They were grabbing for the paper and the pencils to write, even the older kids. And the little nine-year-old, well, she's 10 now, but Lucy wrote down, I love KK's chocolate pudding. I'm, they call me KK. And I thought, bless the Lord, because um, it's a lot, it is really hard to make. It's Cindy's recipe. My friend Cindy's here from Albuquerque, and she, we've been friends for over 40 years. I'm sorry I had already introduced you. That's her chocolate pudding recipe, and there's a story about her in that book. Anyway, um, we're writing down stuff, and you know what? 
It's been amazing. And I can't wait till January 1st of 25. You know what God's done this year? And I just believe it's because we decided to get super grateful. We decided to really give God the glory he was supposed to get and not pass off stuff like, well, we just happened to be at the right place at this time. So my two oldest grandkids were given cars this year. They needed a car. For, no, they're not new. And they've had to have some work done. You know, they've broken down the side of the road. But their car, and we were able to fix them for like $500. They were given cars. They've uh, been able to afford a school for one of their kids when something wasn't going right in another school. Uh, outfits, you know, little things that you think is not a big deal. Like when you find a pair of shoes on sale, I, I quit acting like that's not a miracle. Mike, <laughs> and when you, find, when you find the close parking place, I'm like, I, and my husband says, why are we just riding around and around? We could have parked at the back and walked. I said, I'm waiting for my miracle, and I'm waiting for my parking place. But there are things I'm telling you, today you probably had a miracle happen in your life. If you've not, you'll have one this week. And I'm challenging you. You may not have a miracle jar or a gratitude jar on your table. I'm saying get one. It may be just you and God. Get a gratitude jar. But what do you want to see happen in 25? What are you claiming into your life? What are you calling into existence that's not already there? Do you want a husband? Pray for one. Do you want to get rid of one? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I don't mean it. I don't mean it. Um, do you need a miracle in the lives of your children? Pray for it. Write it in the gratitude jar. What do you want God to do? And I'm telling you, he's going to do it. He doesn't hold back gifts from his children, so I better keep going. Um, so the first thing is, God, the table is a place of provision. Remember and reflect. That's the only way that, um, that we can honor and glorify God with what he's done in our lives. We won't be like the children of Israel. Number two, the table is a place of connection. The table, the kitchen table really is the soul of the home. It's the soul. You know when you go to someone's house, where do you hang out? The kitchen. Usually around the bar, you might sit at the table, but when you have all this space for people to go, and I'm like, get away, and they're all just hovering in the kitchen. Our kids do that. Isn't that awesome? We're drawn to the place where life happens, the soul of the home. It's where the, where the goodness happens, the food. Amen? Um, the kitchen is the soul of the home. So I mentioned family dinner. So about 25 years ago, so my oldest son would have been about 15. And what, I don't know how old your kids are, but when my boys were like 15, 12, 9, they were getting so busy. They were playing football, and Dustin got in high school. We were dropping them off at sports, and I felt like we were never at the table. Um, we would cook because we had to. We couldn't get out all the time. But I felt like we were never at the table. So I decided with my husband, we're going to start having Monday night family dinner. Because at that point, we didn't have really much going on at church, and um, it was our day off. Uh, we were on, you know, we pastored the church, and our staff, Monday was our day off then. So it just felt like the thing to do. My husband could help me. We could get it all together. So we started Monday night family dinners. And it was just the boys at first. Then they would ask, could they bring friends? And I'm like, Sure. It wasn't like a closed party. I wanted more people there. And then they started, you know, they dated and they want to bring their girlfriend. I'm like, don't bring her unless you're going to stay with her because I don't want to meet her and then you're going to break up. Um, they, and then, you know, they got married and their spouses. And now we have, it, it's just grown and grown and grown every single Monday night. And let me just say, I go to a lot of trouble. And I don't say you do this every night because you can't. You're all, everybody's busy. Um, I, I just can tell, and that's how life is. But pick a night. I was saying today, I mean I, I mean, I love Robin, and she's got these beautiful kids now. And I said to her today, it doesn't matter if they're young. Pick a night and say, Onyx, we're going to have family dinner night, just the three of us. We're going to have our family dinner night. It doesn't matter if they climb on the table and they run around. Just pick a night. Pick a special night and tell your kids, if they're one or three or 20, and they may say, I don't want to. Say, too bad, you live here. Um, we're going to have family dinner night. And I'm challenging you. Do something special. Because it's, it's really about the food. And you might think, oh, dude, I don't cook. I mean, so how can it be about the, about the food? It's about the food, but it's not about the food. So what I do, and I challenge you, if you know your kids, if their favorite thing is just homemade mac and cheese, I mean, by box mac and cheese, I don't know. It might be a frozen chicken pot pie, but whatever they ask you for, when, they, when you say, what do you guys want? You can have anything you want. Whatever meal they pick, I take those meals and I tuck them in my mind, and that's what I cook on Mondays. I cook because I want to lure them in. I have older grandkids now. They could choose other places to be. I want them to choose me. I want them to choose my table because I know there we're going to talk about God's provision and we're going to be grateful and we're going to talk these things through. So I want them there. I want them to walk in and go, I love this place. 
and has such great memories of me and my husband and the, the place. So, I mean, food nourishes the body, and the table nourishes the soul. I really love that. And, I mean, that is not the night to decide you're going to cook on family dinner night and cook some, like, strange recipe you found that is everything they hate. I mean, I'm okay with a little kale here and there, but that's not, to, not the night to bring out the kale and the onions and the whatever. I mean, think, think children. Ask them what they want. Break your own rule. You know, you, we all so pent up, and, you know, everybody's got to eat certain things. That, I've got it. I understand. But break your own rule on family dinner night. Go ahead and go all out with the dessert. I mean, we don't have dessert every night, but that night, they, I, I love it. My older grandkids text in the morning and say, KK, what's for dinner? The boys are looking for the, like, what kind of meat are we having? And um, my oldest, my daughter-in-law, Delaney, she's married to my youngest son, Brandon, and she was, uh, only would eat chicken. She didn't eat beef or anything else. When they, lived with, when they lived in Albuquerque. They've since moved to D.C. Um, four years ago to plant a church in the heart of Washington, D.C. But anyway, um, they moved. And then my oldest friend said, Aiden said, why are we still eating chicken all the time? Can we have some steak? <laughs> I said, yes, we'll start having steak. But cook something you know they'll love. Break your rules. Make it the night that they can't wait to get home. Of all the weeks, make it the night they can't wait to get home. It's also a place to belong, that your kids know they have a seat there, their friends have a seat there, that they can bring someone and they're welcome at, their, at your table. And another thing, a challenge that I have for you, and I sound awfully bossy, but I do have the stage and the microphone. Um, <laughs> don't let the table be a place that you're disciplining your kids and, and, and on them all the time and just, uh, and, and fussing at them. The table needs to be a place they want to come. Because think about how God does us and what Jesus, he drew friends to the table. We're not trying to push them away. They may have to be disciplined, but do it in the room. Don't do it at the table. Don't talk about the, the call you got from the school yet. You may have to do it before bedtime, but not at the table. Because you know you associate things with certain places. You want the table to be associated with love and peace and joy and harmony and all things family, all things love. Um, it doesn't matter. I, I'm just, trust me on that. This is a lot of years. I've parented a long time. And I can look back and tell you, the table needs to be a place of joy in your home. It's a place to belong. It's a place of healing. It's a place of emotional healing, of, of mental healing. Your kids can come there, and they know you're not going to judge them there, that they can be at the table with you. And they're friends too, right? You may be the only home that some of your kids' friends can come to and feel safe. Let them know that they're safe there, and they can love it there. It's also a place that strengthens relationships. Every meaningful relationship in my life has had hours and hours and hours around a table. Maybe not my kitchen table all the time, but the table at your favorite restaurant, the table at the coffee shop, um, the tables out there. You've all been sitting at a table tonight. Everything happens around a table. It's a gathering place. So understand it's the place that strengthens relationships. Bonds are formed that last a lifetime. I've been friends with Cindy since 1981. You know, most people th these days don't keep friends that long. We've gone through everything. We've been there. We've been in each other's delivery rooms. We've birthed babies together. We've gone through the, the, the strife and hard times when we've, all these years of pastoring, but we've celebrated joy that's unspeakable. So you need those friendships, but they're not just going to happen. They're going to take hours. It's hard to be a friend, don't you think? It's not easy. I'm a really hard friend to have. I'm a lot of trouble. And it's hard sometimes to be a friend. It takes an investment. It's intentional. And if you're holding back and you say, I don't have friends, I'm sorry. I really am. I'm sorry. But go find some. Go find a friend. We're going to give you an opportunity tonight at the end of the service to I actually do just that. Um, you'll be able to find community if that's what you want. But you need community. You need lasting friendships. I know that my friend is a phone call away. Maybe. She never answers her phone. But anyway. Um, <laughs> but but if she, she would, if she heard it, she would answer that phone. <laughs> Romans 12, 13 says, and get into the habit of inviting guests over for dinner. Get into the habit. That's the Bible. That wasn't me. That was Romans. So get in the habit of inviting guests over for dinner. You say, well, I don't know how to cook. I wrote a cookbook. Aren't you in luck tonight? Um, I wrote a cookbook, but honestly, you can Google anything. It doesn't have to be a big deal. One of our favorite meals were just nachos with two kinds of cheese and jarred jalapenos. And we were so poor, we didn't have, couldn't have meat. And um, there, it doesn't take a lot. You can serve coffee, tea. You can serve something just 
Just open up your home, invite people in. Proverbs 11.25 says, The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. If you are in a funk and you're in a pit or a valley, if you'll pull yourself up and do something good for someone else, you will come out of that pit. It will bring you out if you bless someone else because the generous, if you refresh someone else, you'll be refreshed. I love that. Um, I, hospitality 101. This is what this is. It's just being hospitable. Do what you wish someone else would do. Do it. You be the person. If you're wondering, like, I, I really wish somebody would call and ask me for dinner. Well, you call somebody and ask them for dinner. You step out and start the relationship. I promise God's got someone for you. He's got friends for you. The table really matters. It really is a place of connection. The third thing is the table is a place of blessing. And I've got a great story. You know, um, if you've heard the story in the Bible of, of King David and Mephibosheth. That's a great illustration of covenant and God's promises and the way he keeps his promises through people in the Bible. Um, King Saul and his son Jonathan were killed in battle. Basically, Jonathan was killed and Saul fell on his sword because he was going to get killed. So, and this is a really gory stuff in the Old Testament. But King Saul and Jonathan, they were killed. So King Dave, David became the king. And years after he was established as king, he said to his servants, is there anybody left in the household of Jonathan? Did we miss somebody here or are they all, are they all gone? Is there anyone? Who would go see if there's anybody in the household of Jonathan? And one of his servants, Ziva, said, we'll go look. And they found a descendant of Jonathan. They found his son. He was in a place called Lodabar. His name is Mephibosheth. I don't know why he was, that is a really hard name. You can't say it fast. Mephibosheth. They found him in a place called Lodabar, Lodabar which really meant low place. It was a place of depression. He had lived there almost all of his life. He was in hiding his whole life, afraid someone would kill him, actually, because his dad and grandpa were killed. They took Mephibosheth to King David. And David's like, hey like I would be. And he's going, are you going to kill me? And David's, no, I want to invite you to my table. You, I had a covenant with your dad. So it wasn't about anything Mephibosheth had done. King David said, Mephibosheth, I have a covenant with your dad. And I promised him I would be kind to his descendants and I would take care of them. So I'd like to welcome you to the king's table. You will never want for another thing. You will never lack for another thing. You have a place of blessing. You know, when you sit at the king's table, you're blessed, right? When you sit at the king's table, that's like getting good seats at the best football game, like the 50-yard line, maybe eighth row. Anybody want to get me some? Um, for your favorite team, like when you, you walk in and you're treated VIP, that is what he walked in and said, welcome to the king's table. He inquired, and he gave him that. David chose to honor his promise. David said, I made a covenant. I'm honoring my promise. He said, you will be at my table. 2 Samuel 9, 7 says, don't be afraid. David said, I intend to show you kindness because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul. Imagine, Saul was a king for every, so I'm giving you all that. And you will eat here with me the rest of your life at the king's table. Mephibosheth was crippled. He was dropped when he was a baby, and his nursemaid, like, fell on him and broke his legs. He never walked. He was crippled, which if you were crippled in those days, you were, weren't any good. They didn't, they put you to the side. They put you to the side, but not the king. He said, society may have hidden you and may have put you to the side, but I have a seat at my table for you. It doesn't matter what anybody else says about you. I said, I'm keeping my covenant with you, and you will be at my table. Mephibosheth, verse 12, had a young son named Micah. From then on, all the members of Ziba's household, that's the one that went to find Mephibosheth. He was a servant. All the members of his household were Mephibosheth's servants. And Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, the Bible says it about five times to get that point across. Basically, no one else would have him, but the king does. They lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. I want you to get this. The Bible never wastes a word. If there's a word in the Bible, it's there for a reason. And that one line says, and Mephibosheth had a son named Micah. It's the only time he's mentioned in the entire Bible. One time, Micah, one sentence. But God allowed that verse to be in there, that sentence, so we would know. It wasn't just that David gave this to Mephibosheth, but he gave it to his son. It was generational because of his relationship with Jonathan, Mephibosheth's father. He said, you're going to get it, 
and your kids and your kids' kids, you will be blessed at my table, at the king's table. And I hope you're following along with me because I'm not just talking about King David's table. I'm talking about the table of our Lord, the table of God. We're invited to that table of blessing. And every time we sit at our physical table, we remind, I have a seat at this table because I'm blessed, because I'm at the king's table. You see, I, um, you know, I'm not a first-generation Christian in my family. My grandparents were the first-generation Christians, and they were in the ministry, both my mom's parents and my dad's. They were church planters in southern Alabama when it wasn't cool, when it wasn't cool to plant a church and nobody supported you. Um, but they were first. And then my parents, because my grandparents took their seat at the table, my parents took their seat at the table I never knew what it was like to have parents that didn't serve the Lord. And because my parents did, my sister and I took our seat at the table. Because I took my seat at the table, my three sons took their seat at the, at the king's table. And it was offered to them. And they said yes. And because my sons took their seat at the table, their children, all night of my grandchildren served the Lord. Even the little four-year-old, I don't know quite yet about him. He's a little demonic, but he's coming. <laughs> but in Jesus' name, he will serve the Lord. But they sit at the table because of the, the generational blessing in their life. They sit there around God's table. It was offered to them. They didn't do anything to deserve it. They got it because I did. And I got it because my parents did. So you might be thinking, that's great, Kay. That's five generations. But I'm sitting here. I'm first. My parents... I had a jacked up life. I, it was, everything was in a mess, dysfunctional. I'm it. As a matter of fact, I don't even know if I'm first yet, but I, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. But I'm just saying, somebody has to go first. Someone has to be the first generation that says, yes, I will come to the table that's offered to me by God. I'm going to take my seat at the table because God said, it's free. You can come. You earn the right because I made a covenant. You earned the right because God covenanted with us that if we said yes, we could walk up and sit at the king's table and live in that blessing of generational blessings. So I challenge you, be first. And if you are the first in your generational line, yes, that's amazing. It's got to start somewhere, and we're so happy for you. Last night, people were coming up to me after the service saying, would you write in my cookbook? to the person who was first, because they were the first in their generation to serve God. And I just want you to know, it's an amazing thing. Someone has to take the step and go first. The king's kingdom is for your children, and your children's children, and your children's children's children. That means be my great grandkids. And on and on and on. We're singing tonight that song, you say a thousand generations, and I'm picturing heaven because my parents are in heaven now. And my grandparents and my husband's dad, they're all love the Lord. And I'm picturing those generations in my family today, tonight, gathered around and looking down going, yes, Kay, yes, you carried it on. You took your seat at the table and you're helping other people. And they're just beaming because a thousand generations can experience that blessing of God. It says um, in Deuteronomy 7, 9, I've got tears in my eyes. It says, understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is a faithful God who keeps his covenants. He doesn't go back on his promise, y'all, for a thousand generations. And he lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and, he, and keep his commandments. You keep his commandments and you love him, you are there where the blessings are. You're at the table and you can just eat all day and night. You'll never have to worry again figuratively. You know I'm talking in the spirit now. I mean, you know I'm talking in the spirit. You have a seat at Jesus' table. He has a covenant. He's covenanted with you already. Number four, the table is a place of worship. Um, a beautiful story that de um, depicts this is in the New Testament uh, with Jesus' friend, his really dear friend Lazarus. Um, Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha, and he got really sick. And when he was sick, like sick unto death, his sisters called for Jesus, who was not too far away, but just maybe a day or so away. And uh, they sent someone to get him and said, Jesus, our brother, your best friend, he's dying. Jesus like, yeah. He goes, we need you to come and heal him before he dies. And Jesus stalled. He waited four days. He didn't go to see about his best friend, Lazarus. He, and it seems so uncaring. But I was reading um, from a commentary this week, and it said, and I wrote, this is so cool, the reason probably... I mean, that Jesus did this, he could have healed him without even, I mean, he could have gone right away and, and Lazarus never died. But not only did he want him to die, he wanted to be dead, really dead, and really, really dead. 
Because how else would he get all the glory if Lazarus was just sort of dead? People could have said, well, he's just in a coma. He wasn't really dead and you raised him up. Like Jesus was in the grave three days because they didn't want people to say, he's not really dead. Lazarus, four days. And Jesus finally came and the girls, the sisters like, oh, Jesus, glad you could show up. He's dead four days now. He's dead, 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 dead. And you didn't come. And they're like, where, where were you? And Jesus said, it's not a big deal. Where have you buried him? He knew where he, knew where he was. And he said, roll back the stone. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And he brought him out. And they're like, oh, God, this is amazing. It could have been less dramatic, Jesus, had you done it when he was just in the sick bed. But this is good. He stinks. But we'll wash him up. We're fine. They, I mean, it says Jesus didn't stay long. He left um, because his time was about to come. He was going to be going back to Jerusalem soon to go to the cross and do the whole Holy Week. And so he went away. And then a couple weeks later, he came back. And they were so excited to see him because Lazarus was still alive. Isn't that great? He, he lived 30 more years. He wasn't just sort of healed. God wants to do a whole work in your life. Um, so Lazarus, they came and uh, Martha made a big meal. I could see me doing this myself like, oh, I'm going to cook all day. You're going to get the fine thing. You're going to get my favorite meal. And I have so many favorites. I'm going to cook. Jesus is coming. They had their meal. This is in my mind, but I'm sure I'm right. And they finished the meal. You know how when you have a really good meal and you like the people you're with, you kind of push back from the table. You cross your legs. You might get a cup of coffee. And you, you know you're settling in for the conversation. And they settled in. They were visiting around the table. And there's no coincidence that it's around the table. And Martha's been cooking, and Mary is just overwhelmed. I just imagine her saying, Jesus, it's just been a couple of weeks, but that was so, that was crazy. Like, we sent for you, and you didn't come. But you, you had a plan all along, right? You came four days later, and you called him out of the grave, and he came out, and you, you healed him. And she's sitting there like Martha's busy, and Mary's just sitting there thinking, Jesus, you brought him from the grave. You gave us back our brother. And she's just overwhelmed with God, what God had done in her life. She's overwhelmed with his goodness. And she just got up and went and got the most expensive oil she had. It was worth a lot of wages. And she broke it, and she washed his feet with it. And she used her hair to get all that dirt off his feet and to clean him up and to minister, to worship Jesus. She was at his feet, kneeling at his feet, worshiping. I love this picture because, you know, when we start to talk, around the table, and we share the goodness of God. I mean, we stop thinking, I'm just going to come sit here and be negative and talk about all the yuck in my life and the crap in my life. Can we say that in Oklahoma? Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to worship. I'm going to talk about the good things. I'm going to sit with you. We did that today. You know, you sit and you talk about the good things of God. How can you stand? How can you sit there and not worship when you say, God, look at what you did for my family. I mean, look what you did for me this week. Look what you did. I mean, the table is a place of blessing. Can you just think of something in your mind right now that God has done for you this year? Let's just go big. This year. And you walk in a room, but we, we get so used to it, and we don't pay attention, and we let life get to us, and we walk in a room like this when there's a worship team or in your car, and we're hearing worship music, but we fail to give Jesus the most extravagant worship that we can, you will, I will worship him extravagantly when I stop a minute and say, y'all, I was going down a, a bad path. I was raised in church, but I was naughty as a teenager. I was telling Robin, I was naughty. And Satan really wanted to take me out. I was bad. Um, and my poor parents, what I put them through when I was young, 15, 16, 17, isn't that crazy? And at 19, I was on staff at a church. That's how quick God turned it around. I mean, God's done so much for me. Satan had a path for me that was not this path. So I don't stand here and take it lightly. I think I've got a lifetime behind me, and God just grabbed me. I, if, if he didn't do another thing, oh, and he has, but if he didn't do another thing, I can just be thankful that I was also dead, and he raised me back to life. I was dead like Lazarus, and I thank him because he took me out of that mess and said, you're trying to go a wrong way, but I'm going to send you down the right. I have a plan for you, Kay Woodward. I have a plan for you, and I'm going to save your life. I, if it's just that, if you're a Christian, if you've accepted Jesus, if that was it, it would be worth every ounce of praise you could come up with. You would walk in this place where they're saying, friend of God, you would, I mean, I, you know, I didn't jump up and down either, so I'm not talking just about you, but we would be like, whoa. They're, they're up here killing it, and we're like, you got anything, Andrew? You got another song? I don't really like that one. 
Got something better. That's not my favorite slow song. Could you pick a better one? I really like that one where we change keys. And I've done that in my own church. I sat there on the front row watching my daughter-in-law leave worship. I'm like, where's the good? I mean, she's really good. But I'm like, why do you have that other girl singing at my church? Um, <laughs> and we walk in not paying attention to what we're walking into. We're worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and all he's done for me. And that's one thing. I could tell you what he's done in my life. I could tell you over and over again, and I wish I could. I wish we could sit at a table, even tonight after this service. I wish I could, but you can. You can sit at a table with people in this room, with your family, and you can recount what God has done in your life. He deserves our costly perfume as worship, the most extravagant thing we can come up with. But you know what he wants? He just wants you. He just wants you, your worship, whatever you do. He just wants that. It doesn't take very long to get in a place of worship if you just start to remember one thing, then two things, then three things he's done for you. Maybe you're sitting here tonight and you think, I'm in a bad place, and I don't feel like worshiping. I understand. I mean, my parents are the most godly people I'd ever known. When my dad got sick and died so quick, I thought, this stinks. This is horrible, and he served you all his life, God, and this is what you did? Could you not heal him? He's never done, he didn't done anything wrong. Please heal him. He's our patriarch. I don't want, I'm not ready for my dad to go. And then six months later to find out my mom had Alzheimer's and that is all, it is a horrible thing to walk through. And to walk through that, I said, well, that's definitely not fair. She never even committed a sin, I don't think. My mother was perfect. I thought she was, she's, she was so perfect. And she had to go through that disease and lose her mind. The smartest woman I know. And I question, I sit in church and it was time to worship and I'd be like, I don't feel like it. Actually, I don't feel like it. It makes me sad. It made me sad to worship because I thought they would like to be here worshiping. I had a horrible attitude. And God had to work with me and say, you don't see the big picture. You're just right in the middle of this. And I'm telling you, if you're in the middle of something tonight, there is a big picture. And God is a good God no matter what. He has good plans for you, plans and hope for you in a future. And he wants you to go on the right path. And it, there's good times and bad times when you're serving the Lord because the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And it just happens. And we won't know why till we're in heaven one day. And then we won't care. That's what I told myself. It won't matter then. But God deserves <coughs> worship. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting all, you know. And then I don't want to get the water, but I might have to. Okay, I'm almost done. Two minutes. I'm going to skip the water. Worship will change the entire atmosphere of your home. If your home is in a mess and you feel like snarkiness is rising up, you come home and your kids are not in a good mood and you are in a bad mood, if you're married, your spouse, or if you're coming in alone and you had a bad day, if you need to get out of a mood, you just turn on worship music and you begin to say, God, I choose to worship you. I'm going to change my attitude and I begin to worship you. Worship will change the atmosphere in your car. I challenge you to put on worship music when you're taking your kids to school. Put that music on. Get their mind in the right frame before you drop them off. When you come home and you're cooking, put on some good worship music. And soft, you don't have to like throw, you know, um, you know, shove it down their throat because sometimes teenagers don't love that, but just put it on soft. They don't even know it's just happening in their mind. Worship will change the atmosphere of your home. Trust me on that. So in closing, I just want to remind you about the four things I just said, so you don't forget, because we forget so easy. The table is a place of provision. Wh whatever you need, he will provide. He does provide. I can testify to it. It's a place of provision. It's a place of connection. You will build your greatest community and friendships and relationships around a table. If you're not doing that now, I challenge you to step out of your comfort zone and get around the table. It's a place of blessing. We don't deserve it. And we didn't earn it, but the king himself made covenant with man and said, you accept me, you sit at the table. And then that opens that up for generational blessing for generation and generation and generation to come. And it's a place of worship. It's a place to remember everything he's done and to thank him for it. Not just remember it, but to thank him for everything he's done. So... We didn't have a table when we first got married, and we had hand-me-down tables for years after that. It took us forever to buy a table. I remember our first table. It was, and I, I bought a glass to count top. Who does that? I was Windexing all the time with those kids just vomiting all over it. Um, and then we, you know, got another table, and I got a little better table. 
four years ago, we remodeled our house. We, we knocked out walls because people say you should downsize when you get old. I said, uh-uh, we're expanding. I wanted, all, I wanted the 17 at my house. I want room for everybody. Y'all can all come. I have a lot of beds. Um, but we expanded our house, and we built a table just to hold 20 people, to my whole family. There's our table now. And that room was built. It seats 20. And let me tell you about that table. It's weathered some storms in the last four years. My kids moved. Right after we got that table, my son, my youngest son I told you, and his wife took my three youngest grandchildren all the way across the country to D.C. to plant a church. And I said, he said, it's a hard place, and they need a church, and we need, you know, an evangelical Bible-believing church, more of them there. And I said, there are heathens in Texas right next door. There, <laughs> there are. There are heathens in Arizona, Colorado. It's a day's drive for me, but he goes on the East Coast. I don't know what that was saying, but they moved away. So our table has seen good times and bad times. We've cried tears there. We've rejoiced there just recently. You know, we, we rejoice. We've um, had little bitty tiny newborn babies around it. We've had toddlers and now grown grandchildren and the old KK and Pop. The table has been through a lot. Celebration, loss laughter, tears, but it's more than a piece of furniture, and I wish I would have learned that so uh, many years before. It's more than a piece of furniture. You build it for what you want it to be. If you're alone and you want people to be with you, get a table with four chairs, not one chair, and fill it up. God will, if, if, if you're alone or if your table has an empty seat because of loss, maybe death or divorce or someone leaving, God will fill that seat again. He will fill the seat, and you won't have to be lonely if you choose not to be. God will fill the seat in your home. So get a table and think about where you want, what you want that table to do. Use it for what it was made for. Be intentional with your table. Protect it. Y'all, on Monday nights, our church is also large like yours, and, and they will try to sneak in activities on Monday night. I, I'm not in charge anymore, but I act like I am. And I'll call, and I'll say, cancel it. That's Monday night family night. You guys, for 25 years, I've had to fight for that family night. You know that everything in your life will try to, to take um, precedent over it. You'll have to fight for it. Because remember, the enemy doesn't want your family growing and bonding and getting together and you to have friends and you to be building relationships. He wants you to feel isolated and alone. Fight for it. Use it for what it's worth. Use it for what it was made to be used for and see what God can do in your life. I'd love for you to bow your heads. I just want to pray over you um, before the night ends. I feel such a strong sense and presence of God in here. Um, I, I just don't even know. Maybe some of you were invited and had no idea why you're here. Maybe you've come to the church and you think, I just wanted a friend. I need a friend. Or maybe you don't have good memories at a table. I'm telling you, God can make all things new. He will make all things new. I know I could see you in six months or a year from now, and you would have stories to tell about what God is going to do around your table. So I just want to pray for you and honestly pray a prayer of blessing in your life. Father, I just um, come before you um, on behalf of my friends, God. I just hope that what I said tonight, Lord, would sink in our hearts. I believe that you created the table. Um, you talk about it all through the word. Jesus' last function with his disciples before his death, he gathered them to the table to spend time with them because he knew he had to go away. And God, I just pray that you would let this resonate with us tonight. God, if there are people in here who are lonely and they have empty seats at their table that were once full, God, I pray that you would restore and replace. God, give them back the joy that was once at their table. God, I pray for those who their life is so crazy, they can't see how they're ever going to do it. God, I pray that you would just um, give them creative ways to get people to their table, creative ways to um, make this family night something special. God, I just pray um, that if those who are here who've never um, stepped up to your table, they've never sat at the table of you, Jesus, they've never accepted you as their Savior, I pray tonight would be the night that they would do that, God, that they would pull up to the table and say, Jesus, I just want you to be my Lord and my King. I, wanna, I want that a covenant. I want a covenant with you, God. I want you in my life. I want to go first. I want to set this up for my children and my children's children and my children's children's children. God, I pray a special blessing over this, over this place. I pray that you would um, 
Bless them and keep them. And let your face shine upon them and be gracious to them. And God, I pray that you would lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for jumping on our YouTube page today. Uh, my name is Adam, this is my wife, Christy. We pastor here at Victory Family Church. We talk about family a lot, and we just wanna say uh, welcome to our family. Even if you're online, you are still a part of our family. We'd love for you to subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel and stay in touch with us. Uh, hopefully, the content here will help challenge you, encourage you, grow in your relationship with the Lord and maybe even make you laugh a little bit along the way. So love you, grateful for you. Thanks for joining us.